Okay, thank you all for joining us this afternoon on the the start of the the run in for the finish of the Telltale's Blended Learning Festival. Uh, this session is going to be a bit different to of some of the things we've run throughout the week, where it's going to be more of a a group discussion. And uh, I'm joined by uh, Rama, Maddie, and Henry, who uh, are going to be our panelists, and they'll introduce themselves shortly. Um, Rama and Maddie, current students at Portsmouth. Uh, sorry, not Rama and Maddie. Henry and Maddie, current students at Portsmouth. Uh, Rama, I believe, still is, but on sabbatical. And Rama, our vice president of not for uh, education and democracy, uh, learning, uh, learning experience. <laughs> learning experience. Thank you. Change titles, and it's been a few months as I've seen Rama, so I was I was out of the loop on that one. Um, essentially, this is going to be a, a Q and A session. Uh, all of the panelists are going to give a brief introduction about their experience of online learning. So Maddie and, and Henry, that's going to be a direct personal experience about what's worked, what hasn't worked. And Rama is going to give it a bit of a broader overview of the kind of data that the student union has been collecting, the kind of feedback they've been getting uh, from across the institution. <laughs> if you'd like to ask a question, uh, either to anyone in particular or more general uh, across the whole panel, please post it into the chat and I'll be moderating that as we're going along and putting it to the panelists uh, as and when it's appropriate. Uh, Rama, do you want to, to kick us off? Yeah, um, so yeah, like Stuart said, I'm the learning experience officer. Didn't really experience the, the students going into lockdown, but we collected the data in a way where um, we had a big student survey right at the start of lockdown. So it was right at the time when students were quite new to everything and they were quite uncertain about a lot of things and we wanted to collect that to collect that sort of insight and feedback from students. So what we did was we had, okay, how do you feel things are going and stuff like that. And then after about a few weeks time when they've kind of settled in and they're getting like online learning, we changed or adapted the questions. So um, we asked how you're feeling about it what, um, in terms of also um, well-being, your study environment, um, and what has has or hasn't worked in terms of online learning. So, um, we've collected all that data and insights, and we put it in a um, a presentation, and I could share it and distribute it as wide as possible after this. But um, I'll just highlight some things. Do you want me to highlight them now, or shall I move on to? to uh, it's up to you. I'll everyone introduce themselves and then. Um. Henry, do you want to go next? Hi, uh, I'm Henry. Uh, I'm a computer science student, uh, just my second year, um, currently on the MEng course. So after my placement, I'll be going back for uh, my the BSc section and then hopefully doing the MEng year afterwards. Um, so I've had like a direct experience with the switch to the online teaching methods in lockdown. And, um, yeah, so that's not a big question about it. A knowing smile at the end there, but <laughs> we'll unpack that in a minute. Uh, and Maddie, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Maddie. Uh, it's nice to actually see some familiar faces um, in the chat. I um, I used to work at the university as well as be a student. Um, so due to various personal reasons, um, I'm doing uh, an MSc in Educational Leadership and Management, um, but I've actually had to step away from that for about three years um, and have been kind of trying just to complete my dissertation um, as a single unit. And that's been quite interesting as we've shifted um, through COVID um, in this academic year. Um, personally, I found it quite isolating um, because I haven't particularly been part of a cohort. So if I was actually on campus, I would have been able to go to sessions and meet this current year of students. Um, but I haven't had the opportunity to do that. And there hasn't for me been a lot of um, a lot of face to face interaction with other students on my course. Um, so I probably have quite a few things to say about the challenges that I faced from that perspective. Um, However, I have also had some really positive experiences. Um, I took part in um, a writing retreat that was set up for uh, dissertation students, for master's dissertation students in my um, uh, programme. Um, and that's been really positive. So I'm happy to answer any questions about that and sort of my in experience of those things. Um, yeah. 
Great. Uh, so, Rama, did you want to kick us off by just going over some of the data you're talking about from the Student Union? I see some questions starting to come in, so we'll get to those once you've uh, introduced that. Yeah, so um, I've kind of, we've, we had a wide range from like well-being to learning, but I've picked out the online learning and slash study environment ones. Um, so we asked what in particular helped to reduce your concerns. Um, and in terms of online learning and teaching, some positive, some students found that online teaching, such as WebEx and learning resources have been helpful for continuing study. Um, however, some students found online teaching learning to be less frequent, less engaging or limited compared to usual circumstances. Um, some issues around uh, studying environment was flagged up as well. So um, all students who mentioned this theme were dissatisfied with their studying environment and reasons for this dissatisfaction include um, students supporting family at home, therefore decreasing study time. Um, the working space um, available is limited. Um, harder to concentrate on studies in, in their current studying environment and essential equipment and facilities to, rem to remote working successfully, i.e. the internet is limited or poor. So I know the university is obviously coming in with um, the aid that they're providing students. However, this still will be a wide issue faced by a lot of students. Um, another thing about online learning, some students said that they have more um, online learning study time. So that's a positive. Um, however, other men others mentioned the quality of online learning doesn't compare to face-to-face -face teaching. Um, some students have noted the lack of quantity of online teaching lectures and learning resources. Um, and some students asked to what extent online learning and teaching will continue into next academic year. So I'm pretty sure that's cleared up now. Um, um, so we wanted to hear also anything that worked. So. Most students highlight this theme regarding online teaching and learning as beneficial. Um, and some of the things that they've highlighted included online class meetings, tutorials, lectures with audio via Google Meet worked with Zoom and WebEx, um, forum messaging, emailing students for different tasks, actions, and deadlines, um, WebEx revision sessions, online quizzes, learning and revision resources, including past papers, either via email or Moodle. And some things that didn't really work was um, Obviously, a few students still preferred face-to-face -face teaching support, um, and they had issues with WebEx, VPN, and internet access, which is recurring themes throughout. Um, and some of the, obviously, things we need to improve on in terms of online teaching, which is, I'll, it might be repetitive, sorry about that. So I'll just go on to the highlights, but um, um, a better standardised quality of online teaching resources as the current online teaching provided is not frequent, not detailed enough and do not exist for all students at all, um, which is something that was highlighted. Some students didn't get any lectures in the last two weeks um, or any support. Um, online, uh, live online teaching where possible. Um, all WebEx lectures and meetings to be recorded to watch back after the session ends. Um, Lectures and seminars to be scheduled in a weekly timetable format, similar to face to face lectures. Um, not having group work, which is interesting, is always going to happen. Um, it's always going to be brought up as an issue. Uh, setting up study groups within course cohorts, which is funny because that was straight after group works one. Um, changing the text size and contrast settings of certain learning resources. Improving online exam format. More detailed guidance on certain mo uh, modules. Um, better navigation of the MyPort website and Moodle, ensuring the applications needed for online learning are free and accessible. Um, and some, uh, some students wanted next term's resources and workload, workload to be available over the summer months ready for the next academic year. So those are the highlights. Sorry if that was really long. <laughs> no, that was really useful. Um, I think what I was struck by so many of the the things that were raised have come up during the week as well. So it's good to know that we're we're on course to address a lot of the things students are raising with um, Panopto coming in to support with capturing uh, lecture content. We've had lots of discussions about inclusivity and accessibility through the week. I'm starting to think we should have scheduled this for Monday because it would have set up the week quite nicely. But um, uh, it's encouraging that a lot of what we're trying to do and maybe this raises the importance, which a few people have said throughout the week, of feeding this back to the students, this process where we're trying to upskill as uh, as practitioners and support 
as a community to address those issues, I think is quite important. And perhaps Rama, this is something that we can talk about working on uh, outside of this meeting. But I think that's a really good setup. I'll move on to um, the first question, which I think is probably better answered by Henry and Maddie. So um, the, the new Rama, but if you have any thoughts, feel free to contribute. Uh, from Mark saying, did you get any feedback on the right level of correspondence, particularly at module level? We tried to keep in regular contact so students didn't feel isolated, but we also got feedback that students felt they were were receiving too many messages. Uh, Maddie, to start off with that one. Uh, yeah, so that's that's quite funny because I would actually agree with both of those points. It's interesting when you're when you're sitting just the other side of a computer screen and you're not really seeing people face to face, having a bombardment of emails, for example, can just completely wash out your inbox and you end up not actually being able to even filter through the emails fast enough in order to actually catch the points that are being made. Um, one of the things that personally helped me uh, with that was actually the Moodle messages because I got them as email notifications but I was able to pick up that they were from Moodle and therefore directly related to what I was doing um, much faster than if they had come directly from somebody uh, within the department so for me um, I found that really helpful actually I don't know how others have found that but for me that was really good um, and also um, I think it's quite interesting because when I when I go back to think about it at the start of my particular um, course at the start of our lockdown process we actually did receive an email that asked for some comment and feedback um, about our experience and what we might want to see from the next few weeks and kind of go and for us particularly because we our dissertations actually aren't due um, until September so we sort of actually work over the summer um, and interestingly I actually missed that email. So although I was given the opportunity to give feedback, I missed the deadline because it came in and I was just, oh, so many emails. Everyone's trying to tell me what's happening. I don't really know what's going on. Um, so I actually missed the deadline to actually comment. Um, so yeah, it, I've had a mixture of kind of feeling isolated by not being able to catch those emails fast enough, but also having too many messages and then just feeling overwhelmed anyway. So I don't know if that answers, um, hopefully it does. <laughs> That's a, the, I think that's quite interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm always never sure how to to balance that in personalizing and through Moodle, and uh, I can never decide which is good. So that was useful for me. <laughs> um, Henry, any thoughts on that topic? Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with Maddie in that uh, we do get quite a few emails through, and it is uh, a case of having to filter out what's actually relevant to what you're studying and what is sort of more generic thing uh, emails about other stuff going on in the university. So I think it's important to prioritize what you're sending to students um, and and uh, essentially prioritize individual correspondence. So one of the things that can be quite frustrating as a student is if you send an email to a lecturer about a bit of coursework you're working about that's you know, maybe due in two weeks and then you don't get a response until a few days before it's due. That can be quite stressful. So I think the time should be spent in, in the students that uh, that reach out to you instead of trying to saturate inboxes with sort of stuff just for the sake of sending emails. I think definitely uh, there needs to be a good level of communication, and any information that is needed for the course needs to be uh, needs to be delivered. But that that's that's the sort of information that should be prioritised rather than just trying to keep up a quota of send this many emails and then the student will be communicated. I think it's more important to actually deliver relevant information. And um, just to follow up while you're there, Henry, the Marcus has come back in saying uh, Maddie's comments were, were very useful and they're going to move to using Moodle as the primary form of communication. Would that address some of the concerns you're having or do you like getting emails? Uh, I, I mean, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I would say I usually communicate through, um, through just through email. I don't really use any of the Moodle chat features personally, but uh, I can see why other people might find them useful. I suppose that's about. Um, setting expectations of where the communication is happening, which is going to be more important for starting a new year or a new students coming in, perhaps. Um, Rama, any any thoughts uh, from your perspective or the, from feedback that students have given about communication and the amount of it? You mentioned in, in your report that there are, there are some comments about feeling maybe left without much contact. Yeah, I think um, I was just looking at them now and they said they like getting up to date. Um, uh, information from the university. I think this is more towards, like, I think, when we 
conducted it in this mortal new academic year and no detriment practices. Um, but just having those updates and keeping them informed. I think what Maddie was saying was quite interesting in the sense that you're getting loads and loads of emails, but they're on different platforms. So even if it's on Moodle, you can have an email not email notification. And instead of just looking at the email, you're you're able to go to different platforms, but it's still in one direct place. So it's all organized in your in your inbox. However, it's on different it's in different places. So I think that's quite in interesting. I think that's what we're going to be trying to implement in the union. Um, but yeah, a lot of the commun communication feedback we got was more frequently, but um, more, like more concise also because I know a lot of them were quite convoluted. Um, so yeah, that's all I can say. Yeah. I think there's been a risk, and it's something that I was a bit guilty of, of feeling that you don't want to let students feel adrift. So you're trying to say absolutely everything all the time when <laughs> probably, uh, as you say, being more concise is probably quite important. And I think probably fits in with our plans for the, the Moodle template as well, which is going to add more consistency to everything, including communication. But we'll move on from that because there's a few more questions coming in now. So um, one from Amy. Uh, do you get a general sense of how your course mates and friends feel about returning to study? Moodle will be utilised in a new way. How can we best support you with this transition? Uh, I want to keep the same order for consistency. So, Maddie, do you want to jump in on that one? Um, yeah, so most of my course mates, uh, as I said before, I haven't had a lot of contact with. Um, in fact, it was only this week um, during this writing retreat that I actually got to see some faces of people on my course and got to share some of our kind of trials and errors and what we were working through. Um, I think from that, um, a lot of them aren't returning. Um, they're finishing this year, um, so they're not dropping out because of this environment. They're just literally, that's the end of their course. Um, the, the couple that I did speak to who are staying on, um, there's a lot of anxiety actually around um, what that space is going to really look and feel like. And I think from my personal perspective, I can totally understand that, you know, ha having felt quite isolated because I was just doing one unit out of a whole course. Um, I can see why if there isn't regular face to face interaction with your other course members, if you're working remotely, then you do feel kind of like you're on your um, even if you are having emails, sometimes that just doesn't it's not the same as seeing somebody's face. But on the flip side of that, there's kind of like this, um, I guess, a sort of like face fatigue, you know, like you're when you when you're when you're in person, you're not in front of a mirror. Right. But when you're on the screen in front of the whole time and there's kind of an additional thought process that goes through that, like, oh, my God, do I look OK? Does my environment look OK? I mean, for example, I didn't choose this wallpaper. I hate it. I think it makes an awful background <laughs> and I wish I had something better. <laughs> But that's just what I'm stuck with. And I think there's a there's definitely a sense of creating an environment just like you would for any social media platform. Like if you're going to take an Instagram photo, you don't just snap a quick picture. Do you, you really focus on how I how do I look? What how, what's it going to look like to others? And I think that creates a kind of exhaustion um, a, among everybody because you're constantly faced with your own face, whereas normal interaction you wouldn't be. So I think the idea of being able to optionally have your video on and off is really important like setting those boundaries up at the start to say you can have your video on you don't have to um, and all of those kind of things I think are really important like setting those ground rules as it were for that community so that you feel like you're part of a group again because that's one of the things that's missing from not being in a face-to-face -face environment is you don't feel like you're part of something. You feel like you're just on your own. Even if you are getting emails, it's just not the same as being face to face with somebody and having those conversations. So that would kind of be my, what I've picked up and my own personal on that in terms of supporting that transition. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, Henry, any thoughts on how you feel your, your course mates and your peers are feeling about it and transitioning back to a different feeling kind of um, Moodle and modules and what have you? Uh, well, similarly to as we finish the second year, a lot of us are going to be going on to placement. So I'm not actually sure what the on people going back versus people going on placement. But I know quite a few of my friends are going on placement, and I'm going on placement. Um, right, returning in October, aren't you? Yeah. So I will be back in October. Uh, do know that quite a few of my friends and, uh, and me to a certain extent found that it was 
quite easy to disengage uh, from from the course when we were starting out uh, working from home, not having that face to face contact with lecturers and not going into university. Rick does sort of um, put up a bit of a barrier to engagement, I think. Um, and I can see how that might be a, a problem, especially for people that haven't gone to the university, because there's going to be people uh, first year that have never been to the university that are starting completely online. And that's probably going to be quite a surreal experience, I imagine. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I can understand why it would be a hard adjustment. I think maybe the lockdown period will make it easier for people that were previously at the university to adjust to already sort of dealt with it um, towards the end of the year. Uh, yeah. Just a quick follow up, if you don't mind, Henry, uh, how are you feeling about going on placement? Because I imagine that throws up a whole different range of considerations. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I think starting remotely, um, that might change. I mean, there's new government advice today about working from home. They're saying that they're not going to advise working from home after August 1st. So I'm starting on September 1st. Um, done on a sort of organisation by organisation basis. So I'm not I'm still not sure if I'm going to have to be working from home or not. But, uh, I guess I just have to adjust to whatever. <laughs> I know how you feel. Um, <laughs> so I think we have a, a clearer idea the the university. Um, question from Rebecca. Uh, I think uh, specifically for you, Rama. Was it possible to appreciate any patterns across the student feedback defined by what kind of courses they're on, such as practical versus theoretical courses, lecture based versus studio based? Have you looked at the data in that way at all? Yeah. Um... I don't have it on me now, but we did break it down by a faculty and then we highlighted the key concerns within each one and the recommendations. Um, I, I don't have it on me now, but I can send it to you. I, I can't because it was quite a while ago, but um, it has been done. It has there has been thought put, in, put into it because obviously um, CCI is completely different to BAL, so um, and the requirements. So it has been, but it's just I need to send it through to people. So if I can send it to Rebecca straight after, or would that be helpful? Uh, if it's something that's available for sharing, if you send it to me, I can add it to the festival site, so it can go up alongside uh, the recording of this session, so um, then anyone who wants that will be able to see as well, if that's uh, okay with you, Rob? Yeah. Um, okay, so... Questions are coming in thick and fast now. Is it possible to understand how flipped teaching and learning is received by students in comparison to live online sessions, which are closest to face to face teaching? OK, so this is something which I think everyone's mentioned so far that like it is a different experience face to face. But does that is it a replacement, I suppose, to do things like this where we can see each other and talk to each other? Or do you feel that it's uh, it just still doesn't live up to actually being there in person? Uh, Maddie, do you want to come in first on that one again? Um, yeah, so one of the things um, I think are really important to consider is um, so when we when we think about disseminating to a wide group of students rather than just a small group, if we think about that large group space, what's worked really well for me is having videos of whatever would have been lectured or disseminated um, to us that I can then go and watch in my own time. I can go through, I can pick up any resources I need, I can pause the video, I can think about what I'm um, supposed to be doing and I can go back into that whenever I want to. Uh, for me, in terms of that method, that's actually in some ways worked better than face to face because I actually have the time to go through it at my own pace and I might be working at a different pace to my peers. I'm quite a visual learner. So actually having a video of somebody that I can go back through has been really, really useful. And that's something which um, actually they did at the start of the year. Um, so it was already in place it was already ready to go um and they did that via moodle and that worked really well um and i think that's partly because we do have distance learners on our course um so they already have to think about how to include those distance learners in the whole process it's not all just face to face um so for me, that's really positive um in terms of small i think that's better well, I mean, it depends what you're what you're doing, what the aim, what the objective is. Again, for me, it's worked really well to have small group sessions in video, um, like Stuart just said, in this environment where there's maybe six to eight people maximum. Everyone's got their video on if that's what they want to do. And we do a similar thing. We mute when we're not talking. Um, we can raise a hand. We can interact in that way. 
in terms of the platforms this is the first time i've experienced webex actually being used like this and for me it's really not very intuitive I'm, i find it quite frustrating i i'm using a, a microphone but i can't actually use the function to mute myself on this with webex whereas like when i was using zoom i can use this so i can just sit back i can relax i can talk and i can just unmute and mute myself at will whereas now i have to really concentrate about finding the mute button on the screen and actually that's really distracting so i think there has to be some effort put into the kind of platforms you use for interactive sessions um, so that they are actually usable and user friendly. Um, I feel like this particular setting is it feels outdated. Um, it's it's not as intuitive as Zoom, for example, um, even as Google Google um, video teams, whatever it is, even that is more intuitive than this. So I think if the university is going forward thinking about online learning they definitely need to focus on which platforms are actually the most effective to use um, with different groups of students different sizes of students and depending on what the subject is as well thanks buddy i think you'll find a few people have agreed with that sentiment throughout the week um henry uh how do you feel about that strongly uh, on, on many of the points raised there. Definitely standardization of platforms and time paying and lecture delivery and everything I think is basically the main problem that needs to be solved here in that individual by their own discretion we're sort of deciding what platforms to use at least uh, for my course so we had some lecturers wanting us to use Zoom, others wanting us to use Google Meet um, and I feel like that is you know firstly it's a hassle to have to be signed up to a bunch of different um, uh, services but it also just creates a kind of I, I think standardization is definitely very important for a consistent uh, learning experience for all the students. If you're having to use different platforms all the time, then you're going to have different experiences and it's just it's, it's just difficult to, to, to manage that. And uh, linking into that, um, another point raised about uh, the recording of lectures. I had some uh, one of my friends yesterday I was talking to was frustrated at the fact that a, a few of a few lecturers would just record um, their PowerPoints with a voiceover and sort of deliver the lecture like they would in person, but as a recorded video, and others would um, host a live call like this, and they'd still go over the lecture uh, slides and, and, and present it as they would in a live setting, but it, yeah, the students could ask questions. And the person I spoke to yesterday felt that the most important, valuable part of the lectures uh, in university uh, in person is being able to interact with the lecturers like that and to be able to ask questions sort of as they, as they come up and having that space to interact and get you know an answer to a question is so sort of valuable and they were frustrated by um lectures being just pre-recorded i sort of i i can i can appreciate both both sides of that i do think it's really useful to be able to go back to a lecture after it's happened and go through it and if you miss anything be able to like you know, patch up a hole in your notes or or, or or something like that um i know a few lecturers last year did record their in-person only a I think one out of all of my lecturers did that. Um, that was one of the things I spoke to with, uh, I've spoke to Stuart about uh, actually at the beginning of the ambassador program was um, trying to streamline the process of recording in-person lectures. Um, I think probably the best solution for that would be to maybe offer a, a mix that lectures could be pre-recorded um, in that the lecturer will go through the, and the slides and record and present it as they would in person, but then kind of, to go along with the lecture after the students had had a chance to go through it at their own pace. Um, I definitely think there, need, there does need to be a, a level of interaction, otherwise there's going to be a significant loss of value for the students. Thanks, Henry. That's um, that's good to hear because that sounds very similar to the the recommendations we're making with the the new templates for Moodle. That, uh, so hopefully that's going to not work for you necessarily because you're not coming back in October, but um, for other students who feel similarly. Uh, Rama, any any thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I can only like echo what Maddie and Henry were saying, but in terms of the issues that we found at the student union, a lot of students, because particularly with the new students that are coming in, um, when they have less than satisfactory sort of online learning or teaching or, or resources in that sense um they don't flag it up because they have nothing to compare it to or a standard um so i think it'll be really useful to have um expectations or or just things that would set um 
standard for all students to expect because if they haven't got that expectation they can't see whether someone's meeting it or not and they will just accept and adapt to what is given to them so um yeah it was it was an issue that was flagged up and i think we're going to be working on um how to keep students engaged with the quality of what they're being given um in terms of learning and teaching sounds great um let's go back to the chat um oh, i've lost my place there we are um have the students been able to maintain or retain a supportive relationship with a personal tutor uh Maddie, do you want to come back in again? I've got stuck in a in an order I'm going in, so that's what I'm going to stick with. That's all right. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a tricky one, isn't it? Because you don't want to, um, you don't really want to isolate somebody, and that's a very personal question. Um, but I suppose if I answer honestly, not really. Um, I think that's the one thing in my experience that was lacking is that I was getting communication from, uh, you know, my heads of modules, etc, the leader of the course, etc. But actually, my personal tutor didn't reach out to me once. Um, it was only when I actually had to send something to them to be approved um, that I started a dialogue up again. And I think that definitely there needs to be some standards set around um, how those personal tutor sessions are conducted. I mean, obviously, I'm doing my dissertation, so it's a very supervisory relationship, which is, oh, my chair just hit me in the head. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know why that did that. It's a bit broken. So, <laughs> um, so there definitely needs to be some standards set around um, how those personal tutor sessions are conducted and, and what both the staff and students can expect from them, because it might have just been that actually my personal tutor didn't even realize that that was something that was important um, and I th and I think yeah that's definitely something that needs to be considered and something needs to be put in place so that students aren't left accidentally because they're not maybe getting that contact with another member of staff because if we're honest you know not everybody gets on with their personal tutor anyway so we need to be thinking about what happens in those circumstances and and how that process can be um, maintain to support those students and those members of staff. You know, we're going through a massive change and that is stressful enough for everybody. So it's not just um, the students that have to be at the focus of that, it's also the staff. And having the time to have those, those sessions, online sessions take longer, they just take longer. Um, so, you know, if you're even if you're having an online face to face meeting with one person, that session is likely going to take longer than a quick pop into the office and have a chat. So I think those things need to be considered as well. Thanks, Maddie. Henry, thoughts on personal tutor? Uh, personally, my uh, tutor did. Uh, personally, my personal tutor. Did uh, reach out to me and uh, the rest of the duties, uh, and there was like a level of dialogue there. I didn't actually um, contact them myself, but they sent us an email at the beginning of lockdown, and I think maybe once or twice afterwards, basically saying uh, that they were there if we needed to um, talk to them about anything. They mentioned the idea of perhaps doing some kind of like one-to-one, um, -one, like video conference or something to to talk to the tutors. Um, that uh, tutees, sorry, but that didn't uh, that didn't come to fruition, but. I definitely felt like I could have communicated with my um, personal tutor if I needed to. Uh, and I didn't feel like I'd been abandoned or anything. But I think that, that is definitely going to vary on a, on a tutor by tutor basis. Yeah, um, two very different accounts there, as you say, Henry. Uh, Rama, anything that's been coming your way about personal tutoring? Yeah, um, not really from students, but from meetings uh, with the personal tutoring framework that's probably going to come out. Uh, this upcoming academic year. Um, so hopefully that will create some sort of standard um, among personal tutors. And I did hear that the calls that were going out from personal tutors to students and when, when lockdown happened were really successful. That's why it was rolled out. Um, I think um, one of the issues that came out of that was um, a lot of the personal tutors found it difficult to start up conversations that were difficult for the student because they were quite personal and it was um, it was like, what, what, so what do I do? Do I listen to what's it, what's the issue, or do I signpost? Because then that can be quite dismissive as well. So it's finding that balance between having a supportive member of staff there, but also um, having barriers in which that member of staff isn't too involved in that student's life. Um, 
so yeah it's I, I don't think we'll ever have all amazing tutors um so it is really difficult sorry Maddie <laughs> so it's really difficult um to put in place resources for students who have not had a very engaging personal tutor so maybe that's something that should be worked on a bit more Maddie, yep go um, yeah, can I just um, chip in that there? <laughs> I think um, I think this is an issue which um, was already there before we had to think about doing it in an online way. You know, this isn't this isn't a new issue uh, for the university, and it's not a new issue for universities in general. There there is always going to be issues around how personal tutoring is conducted and and how you get that balance right in terms of support and signposting and listening and giving advice. And I think that's something which is is a consistent issue it's not it's not just become a new issue because we have to do things differently no i think that's a very good point and um as rama alluded to i know there are new guidelines and support in the pipeline coming out for this which i think has been in the pipeline for a while beforehand anyway um so maybe we can sign post to some resources related to that when we put these uh this recording up on the on the site anyway we're over halfway through and there's still a few questions to get through so um Let's move on to, is there anything uh, that you or your peers actually preferred about online delivery as opposed to, to not being worse? Uh, Maddie, do you want to go on with that one? Um, yeah, so for me, accessibility um, is a massive plus. Uh, I suffer from uh, chronic illness, which means often actually difficult for me to go out of the house. Um, so personally, being able to just open my screen and talk to somebody online and and for that to be the norm has actually been really beneficial. Um, so yeah, I would say accessibility is definitely a good one. And I mean, that includes, you know, even for distant students or even students that don't have any kind of disabilities or difficulties. I think that's definitely a big plus. Um, I did write down a few things. Um, having chat functions within the online spaces, um, it's almost like slightly more structured than you might have in a in a face to face session. But um, that's actually been quite freeing, I think, because people can just put emojis when they agree to. With we're so used to doing that now culturally that I think that that's definitely been a positive um, and also having a facilitated session. So even if it's not like a direct lecture or a structure like that, having a session that is facilitated. So there are kind of there might be an aim that you're working towards or there might be a kind of semi structure and that could even be agreed at the start of the session. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, prescribed that that's how every session has to run. But I think being being a bit flexible around that and finding out actually what your students need within that space um, is probably going to be quite important. You know, having some open conversation spaces where people can just come and discuss ideas and uh, raise questions, um, a bit like what Henry was saying earlier about being able to have an interactive space. Um, I think um, doing things like that definitely um, is really positive. Um, and also, in some ways, I mean, I talked a lot about the negatives in terms of anxiety, but actually, there's a flip side to that in that it's positive because although I have to look at my face the whole time and that's not great. Um, I actually don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to meet anyone. I can I can dip in and out as I want to. You know, if I suddenly didn't want to participate, well, I could just turn my video off and turn my audio off and um, and have, have five minutes out. And I think actually having a bit more freedom around learning and teaching and being a bit more flexible in the ways that we provide that is fantastic. And it's actually great to see that a lot is being done and a lot is being planned um, for the coming year. As a result of COVID, I mean, that's fantastic that it can step off something so challenging and turn into something that's potentially really positive. Great. Henry, things you that you thought were, were better uh, in the online environment? Um, I'm not say, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can say that I particularly found anything about the, the lecture to delivery itself uh, better uh, from the move uh, from in person to um, uh, to, to remote because well it obviously there's going to be a, a period of time where uh, the lecturers themselves have to adjust to it and the students have to adjust it but there were a lot of inconsistencies with with how things were being delivered and particularly uh, one of the things that was frustrating was timetabling obviously it had to change from the timetables we had while we were, while we were at university because the lecturers can't adhere to that same structure if they're at home and their families and whatnot I understand that but the the timetables that we had 
were not standardized they weren't put on on my port with our timetable so we had some lectures some lecturers were adhering to the old timetable uh, most of them weren't and then we didn't have any centralized location of accessing that so that led to quite a few students missing lectures i missed a couple of lectures because of that um so i found that quite frustrating but as a computer science uh, um to get on to the positives uh, I, my course was already very uh, easy to just do from my laptop um, we're allowed to use personal computers in the in the lectures. We don't have, uh, in the practical. Sorry, we don't have to use the uh, university computer or anything. So all of my work was already on my laptop. The move to doing everything from home, in terms of uh, in technical terms, was uh, very easy because I already had everything I needed on my laptop. And the university uh, access to resources has been brilliant. So like, access to LinkedIn Learning is really good, and uh, any of the software I've needed to use, I've been able to either through it being free in the place or getting a student license so i've not had any problems with that so i'd say yeah i uh at the actual technical side of the work has been just as easy as it ever was um, yeah uh rama you flagged up a few uh things that people were speaking positively but then you have that kind of tone that it's actually better than uh it was previously yeah i mean um a few things that i mean again echoing what everyone else is saying i think flexibility is really important when I was a student, I had like about two jobs, plus volunteering, plus my degree. So um, when I wasn't attending my lectures, there's that anxiety of I'm missing out or um, like I that anxiety of constantly being behind on things. And I think when everything's online, um, although I know it came out of a really bad situation, things are, are online now. And I think it's moved the sector in, a, in the sense that there was a lot of academics who are really anti putting things online or are you not going to attend and that fear of lack of attendance means lack of engagement um so i think now it's it's moved us further down the line in terms of um we are we're now putting things online um it's helped students who have who need that flexibility in their timetable um where they can just decide to um, listen to a lecture later on or um have flexibility in their timetable to um have some time for studying so that's really useful i think um when in the last few months when, when lockdown happened, um, a lot of students really didn't know what we do as a student union. So I think um, we had a really, really large um, engagement. So for example, in, in with the student survey, we had the largest engagement ever, ever in, in any survey that we've done. So I think now because things are so different, students are going to engage more because they want to know what's what's new, like what, what do they have to do, what they have to get used to, do, what they have to adapt to. So I think being able to utilise that engagement from students and pushing things out and reinventing what you want as your priorities um in terms of well-being or your personal tutors we're able to have like almost like highlight that on our moodle pages and stuff like that so it does give us with a positive outlook it does give us a space where students are now engaged and um, with online material and i think also um yeah some of the things i picked out was interactive sessions and more online study time which was like the two big positive things that came out of the thing i could send it through anyway after so great so we're drawing towards the end so we've got a question i'll ask sure there's one last question they want to try and race to get in while we're answering that one please do uh, but this one from sharon um how are you finding accessing help and resources from the library have you heard of any students interacting more with the library via email or chat Maddie, we'll loop back around to you again. Um, I honestly know I, I've been using the library in the same way that I was before. Um, one of the things I think is a shame is not having those spaces where you can go out of your own environment. Um, like um, Rama said earlier, not everybody has a place where they can set up and study at home or even in their room or wherever they are. Um, so I think having the library closed has probably been really detrimental to a lot of students. Um, I actually personally was using a different university library because um, I was uh, distance doing my dissertation. Um, and I think actually, not being able to go there meant that during COVID I sort of lapsed into a pit of oh, I don't know what I'm doing where am I going to start how am I going to get back into things um, and I can imagine there are a lot of other students out there who've been in a similar position whether or not they're distance uh, just not having that access to the physical library space. Henry uh, how have you been using the library or any of your peers? I agree uh, with the, the fact that it has been difficult not being able to go to the library 
because I, I would go there quite often uh, in between lectures and stuff um, to the to the uh, silent area uh, to work on my projects and things and having to work from home in that regard has been stressful and being stuck in the same room for like 90% of the day has not been nice. Uh, I can definitely empathize with that. In terms of accessing online resources, uh, it's fine. In the, um, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've not really had any problems with, with uh, being able to access any from the library online. Um, I think uh, a couple of the ebook solutions are a little bit clunky to use, but I, I've not really had any major issues with it. It's the same as it has been um, like outside of Rama, any thoughts on the library any, that have come your way? I don't think so. Um, I think it's been touched on already, but um, I think it'll be good. I think um, students interacting more. I know when I was a student, I was I'm, I'm a law student, so books you, you, when you when you wanted to get your books at the start it was it was like books olympics like whoever gets there first gets the book the good ones um so i think having them as ebooks is going to be really useful particularly with um good courses that are quite content heavy you need a lot of reading so just having them as ebooks would be quite useful so i think you'll find a bit more engagement through that okay thank you all uh final question julian has one of the uh do you concerns about the quality and standards of education in this new environment and what might those concerns be? Maddie? Um, so I think my concerns would largely be about inclusion um, and ensuring that uh, a sense of community is maintained for students. Um, if you're not able to meet with your peers um, and develop new relationships and things in quite the same way, I think there's a danger that, you know, the, the retention rate is going to drop and that students are going to feel uh, that they need more support in terms of mental health. Um, uh, yeah, I think those are my biggest concerns really is is about support for students uh, moving forward and also about being motivated and engaged. Um, you know, online learning isn't new. The Open University have been doing it perfectly well for a very long time. Maybe there's a lot we can learn from them. Um, I think it's just about ensuring that we adapt in a way that includes um, everybody to the best of our ability, really. Agreed. Uh, Henry, uh, what do you think? Yes, uh, I do feel that blunt has been sort of a significant reduction in the quality of uh, uh, of the, the the ability to learn since lockdown. Uh, I, I kind of think to a certain degree that that was sort of unavoidable. It was uh, quite a large um, event that has uh, impacted everyone, even you know, impacted personally by the effects of uh, coronavirus and having to adapt quite quickly from being uh, in, in a face-to-face -face environment to being in a remote environment was never going to be frictionless. Uh, but yeah, definitely. Uh, I haven't found it as easy to um, uh, to, to study since we... Um, it, or, 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 I, I found it harder to engage with, with my subjects, definitely, since um, since lockdown. The actual, as I said before, the actual technical work and coursework and stuff was, was pretty similar because I'm using the same computer. Had, a, have a, had access to everything I needed. But in terms of lectures and things, the inconsistency between lecturers really made it difficult to attend in the same way that uh, I was able to when we were in face-to-face, uh, -face. actually even knowing when I had uh, lectures and stuff was difficult. Sometimes it might just be buried in an email from three weeks ago where a lecturer said they would do the lecture at this time that week, and then it's not put on my port, so I don't know when the lecture's going to be. And then there are a couple of instances where I knew about like five or 10 minutes in a lecture from like a Slack message which is never good. Um, so I would say, yeah, there was definitely a reduction uh, in the quality of, of, of we're well, not teaching, I don't want to say teaching, because it's not, it's not the lecturer's fault, um, but there, there needs to be adjustments in, in how everything's delivered. And I feel like the experience of having to do it now in sort of this uh, pressured environment where, they, where there was no choice is going to uh, help in the future with distance learning, I imagine, and definitely with um, the return to teaching in October. Uh, but yeah, uh, to put it bluntly, and a reduction in the quality. Rama, um, thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I think that's a huge, huge, huge concern um, because also a lot of students um, will question why they're paying nine thousand two hundred fifty for um, a course that's obviously not of anyone's fault, but because of the situation, reducing quality. 
um, and isn't what they should be paying for. Um, I know from the SU perspective, one of the biggest issues is students not flagging it up. Um, I know I've, I I spoke about it before, but when the when the few courses that were flagged up eventually to us, where they haven't had any online teaching or any support from students a lot from staff from the last two weeks of um, during lockdown, um, it wasn't flagged up until a lot later, and that's because I kind of had to ask questions like, oh, did you get any support? Did you get this? Did you get that? And it didn't happen until um, I had to initiate the conversation. So um, it kind of makes us question like, what is the standard for students and how are we able to have that accountability of staff and lecturers um, of what support they're giving students and the quality. So what students should be expecting. Um, yeah, and I think it is something that we're going to push a lot next year and hopefully um, students will flag things up a lot more. But yeah, it is going to be quite tricky in terms of quality. Okay, um, I think we we'll have to to draw a close there. Unless uh, any of you three have any final thoughts you'd like to share? No. Well, in that case, uh, thank you very much for for your reflections. Uh, I think what I'm impressed by and uh, pleased about is that it seems to chime with a lot of the things that we're planning uh, for September, October, the kind of concerns you've raised, but also what's working. So, and the kind of things we've talked about this week, um, lots of comments coming in, thanking you and saying how insightful and helpful it was uh, to, to hear your perspectives. So thank you all. And thank you everyone who's joined us. Um, as I said, we're, this has been recorded. So we'll put this up on the festival site and Rama is going to share uh, her report with me, so that'll be there for you to look through about uh, a bigger picture of what students have said. Um, thank you, everybody.